Thank you for joining us for our program tonight. I'm Lisa Falk. I'm head of community engagement for the museum, and I'll serve as your host for this afternoon. As many of you know, the Arizona State Museum is part of the University of Arizona, located in Tucson. We're on the ancestral lands of the Tonatam Nation and Pascoyaki tribe. The museum's collections and research focus on the indigenous people of the Southwest and Northwest Mexico, and we present programs exploring the history and cultures of this region. Today, we're going to learn about the historic use of water by the Wakatam and their success in court to protect their water rights. Tonight, I'm happy to welcome Giselle Ramon Sabaron, who is Wak Atam from the San Javier District of the Tana Atam Nation. Through her research for her doctorate dissertation in American Indian Studies, she is documenting the use and struggles related to water for San Javier and how members of the district, including her aunts and grandmothers, successfully fought in court for protection of their water rights. In addition to being a PhD candidate at the University of Arizona, Ms. Ron Sabaran is also a full-time instructor in Tanatan Studies at the Tanatan Community College. Kutash Anya Abdugi Jasel Ramon Sabran Shapwat Gamachit. Anya no wood PhD candidate, kja ja kja mentor, kja mashkamatam, kja ahonadam. So Good evening or good day. Uh, my name is Giselle Ramon Sabran and I come from the San Javier community on the Thanatha Nation. And I wear many different hats. Um, Lisa mentioned that I'm a PhD candidate and I just started um, as full-time faculty with uh, Thanatha Community College. I'm also a mom. I also serve as a mentor for the Thanatha Student Association at the University of Arizona. And um, I'm also a journalist as well. So um, I'm really excited to be here and to share what, I, what I've learned um, you know, through my dissertation research that I'm working on right now, um, but then also to uh, just to kind of be able to share in general. Um, I, we are an oral society and I do believe that there is information that is specific and strictly for Thanatham tribal members, but also too, I think that the information, um, there is information like that I'm gonna share with you today that um, I believe needs to be written down and is okay to share. So um, without further ado, I'll go ahead and start with my PowerPoint presentation. And I always wanna share this um, whenever I give presentations, I don't speak for the entire Thanatham Nation. I speak for myself and what I have learned and what has been taught to me from my family and um, mentors along with elders. And also too, I don't see myself as an expert in any way. Uh, I, I'm still learning every single day and wanted to just kind of make, the, make those announcements before we get started. So, before we totally dive into um, history of land and water in San Javier, I wanted to be able to share a little bit of uh, background for those of you that are not too familiar with the Thanatham. So we believe to be descendants of the Huhukam and the Huhukam were a prehistoric North American um, tribe that lived between 200 to 1450 AD. And they occupied a big area of South Central Arizona from Flagstaff to the Mexican border or Mexico border, mainly along the Gila and Salt Rivers. And that's what you see in this map here. So this kind of dark gray blue area um, is what I'm talking about. And the word hukum in Atham and Pima languages means those who have vanished because it's unclear what happened to our ancestors. In our Atham uh, Himatag, our way of life, we have stories that tell a lot about our history and why things are the way they are, you know, um, and we have our own beliefs about what happened to our ancestors. But then there's also anthropological theories uh, to what happened to them, which range from disease, you know, came in and uh, wiped them out, drought, another one, um, is they migrated into uh, with another tribe and intermarried and so forth, just to give you um, a, a few examples. And then um, also too, there is uh, Autumn in Sanavir 
who say that they are descendants of the Sopapiri or the Saifiri Indians. And Dr. Denny Seymour has been working with the Santa Vera District to explore that more, um, interview individuals, you know, go out to sites and and so forth. And so um, the Swipery Indians were an upper Piedmont group who occupied Southern Arizona and Northern Sonora in the 1400s to 1800s. And they were a subgroup of the Otham or Pima and then surviving members, like I mentioned, which include Don Otham specifically for, from Sanavir. And um, for myself being from Sanavir, I really never grew up knowing about the Sopa Piri or Swipery. And um, it again, isn't until Dr. S um, Denny Seymour started to um, research. And my mom, she likes to do research as well. Um, she's a retired Autumn history, culture and language teacher. And she started to look into our family history and found that uh, my family we are descendants of the Swipery. And she was able to trace back uh, our one of our relatives to that group um, as one of the last chiefs. And it was really fascinating and really interesting to know that. So again, it's being able to gain some of that history that most likely um, was lost with, with tribal members. So, and so talking a little bit more to give you some more context. So early life of Autumn. Um, and I, I like talking about this because in order to get a better understanding of why things happened and why the history is the way it is in San Avir, you have to understand the terrain. So we were river people, semi-nomadic and hunters and gatherers. And again, it all had to do with where you were living. So in Sanavir, we were considered river people, Akimiratham, because we have the Santa Cruz River. And um, that I've been told is called Adi Akimil, so small um, river or baby river. And we've been timing, uh, we've been farming for time immemorial. And that comes from our, our ancestors, the Hulukam, who were very um, smart and, and were able to create these very intricate canal systems that were huge and be able to live off the land. And so, um, and then as, as you moved uh, kind of, to us it's west, but it's the Eastern part of the main reservation to make that, um, to, to give you an idea of where it's at and that they were semi-nomadic. So Otham generally spent summers in their field villages um, in the desert near water. Then during the winters, they would stay in their well villages by mountain springs. And then as you had on the west side of the main part of our reservation, um, you had hunters and gatherers where the land was really open. And that's kind of uh, to give you perspective uh, near Oregon Pipe National Monument out that west. Um, and so also too, looking at how the terrain is out there, you know, very open and then the ocean wasn't far away either. So being able to, you know, um, travel and be able to go all over in that area. So very diverse within um, not only the way my people lived, but also too with how the terrain changes. So next time, if you're ever Taking a drive, you know, if you're going to Ajo or Puerto Penasco, Rocky Point, pay attention to driving out on 86, or even if you're going to Sells, um, you know, look at how the land changes. And so um, here's a, a photo. I like having visuals. And this is my great great grandmother, Martina Arnita, and she was a basket maker. And so this is her. Um, sitting on the ground, um, working on a basket. And our baskets are made out of yucca uh, and bear grass. And the black that you see in baskets is devil's claw. And then if you ever see a basket with red in it, that's um, banana root. And so you can see on her basket here, she has uh, a design and working on it and she's using devil's claw. And so 
Um, just to kind of also give a little bit more about my family, um, because they do come from one of the original families in Santa Beer. And um, uh, my family, they were farmers. And this is a photo of um, our family's farmhouse that was, um, if you've been to the Santa Beer Co-op farm, this would be northeast of where the main buildings are today. And so these are my great grandparents, Franken and Selma Rios with my grandma and um, her brothers. There was actually uh, about, we were able 12, 13 um, is kind of what we were able to find out, um, children. And so then this is, my grandma was born in 1923. So this is late 1920s and uh, through my research, through papers I've written and whatnot, I was able to, one, one evening I was working on a paper and I was getting frustrated and I was like, okay, I'm gonna take a break, but I'm gonna read this book. Well, you know, take a break from writing for a moment. And I came across this photo and, <clears throat> I, and it was a picture of my great grandfather. And so um, here he is, and there was two photos actually, but I really like this one. And, you know, it's a picture of him discussing the methods he used in raising um, cotton. And he was, from the stories that have been told to me, he was, he was very friendly and he wanted to be able to share knowledge and, um, you know, help, help others out. And so, um, again, never had seen him before, always heard stories, but to actually see this photo of him was the first time, you know, I got, I, you, only, you know, you sit there in your mind and you kind of, you know, wonder, well, what do they look like? And so this was, again, my first glimpse. And then um, after my grandma had passed away, we found these other old photos. And so here's a photo of her two down, oops, sorry, down at the bottom. Um, and these are squash that used to, they used to grow in, in their farm fields. And my grandma, um, her name's Lena Rios Ramon. And so again, um, this was probably, I wanna say maybe late 1920s, early 1930s. And then even in front right here of this family photo, you can see um, crops growing. And so looking at how our ancestral lands are of the Otham. So I showed you the, the Hukum and, and this is now looking at um, thun -thun. And so pre-contact is what is in the orange dotted line, which is very similar to the hookum. And then today is, our reservation today is what's in the solid. And the square down here is Sanavir. And then this is the main part of our reservation. And then there's two other small parcels that are up, uh, Gila Bend and then in Florence. And so pre-contact, um, uh, Autumn inhibited an enormous area of land in south in the southwest, extending south to Sonora, Mexico, north to central Arizona, west to the Gulf of California, and east to the San Pedro River. And if you're not familiar with San Pedro River, is it's um, east near Sierra Vista. And these dotted blue are um, Autumn villages that are in Mexico because 18 54 Gatson Purchase took place and split our ancestral lands in half. And we were never involved in the planning making. We never had a seat at the table. Um, it just happened and it divided our people and um, they never had a say on what side of the border they wanted to be on. But that's a whole nother um, topic within itself. And so, Looking now, getting into talking about Sanavir. So today, Sanavir is one district, one community, but it was not, not always like that. So traditionally, Sanavir had many um, small communities. And so, if let's look at this. So you, this is north, up top where this where it has the title here. And so this is Valencia Road. And then you come down here, this is Mission Road. And then in the heart of Santa Vera, where the Santa Vera Del Bach Mission is, is where, is where I'm circling right now with my cursor. And then as you see here, there's 
many different um, villages or communities that once were in Sanavir. And then you have um, the Oidak, which is our fields. And you see that here. Um, and again, this is east siding of the airport over here. But um, I never knew about this. And so again, um, you know, diving into my dissertation research and finding information, talking with individuals. My mom was like, have you ever seen this? And I was like, no. And then she pulls this out. She's full of great materials. So this is one of which that she shared with me. And um, again, you know, giving you another visual and idea of what Sanavir used to look like um, at one point in time. And so now getting into talking about our topic of today. So when I included land and water because you can't talk about one without the other. And that is a big part of looking at, um, you know, today's discussion, but also too, um, and with my dissertation research. So um, to begin, and it's, uh, this is a part of the reason why Sanavir's history is a little bit different than the other parcels of the Thanatham nation. So um, in 1874, Sanavir became uh, a reservation. And so if you ever see signs it, uh, along I-19 or you know, on off a mission, you see a sign that says Sanavir Indian Reservation. And so it's the first reservation that was established for Thanatham. And back then we were called Papago. And so um, following the establishment of the first reservation, which not everybody could live on. And so it was just, again, the first of um, four. And so when allotment happened, so in 1887, the General Allotment Act happened, known as the, also known as the Dawes Act. And so the purpose of the act was to give each Native American per, a person um, a piece of land. And it all depended on your family size. So if you were single, you know, married with one child, married with 10 children. Um, and the purpose of it was to introduce individualism and then also um, to, in, a, in the federal government's eyes, to um, make Native Americans successful and become assimilated into American culture. And so by giving um, Native Americans land, they would farm, ranch, or harvest timber on those lands that they were given that parcel. And so the US government never consulted with tribes or you know any individual Natives about the Dawes Act prior to passing it. And so again, the government believed that if Americans were given, Native Americans were given individual plots of land, um, then they would be able to assimilate. And so um, in Sanavir, what were we already doing? We were farming and we had been farming for time immemorial. So with my research and conversations I've had with different individuals that I've interviewed, um, I've come to the conclusion that for one, Sanavir went through allotment and was the only part of the Thelonautham Nation that went through allotment because it was established at the time. And then second, the US government saw it as an easy assimilation because we were already doing what they wanted us to do, which was again, farming. And so um, they uh, came to Sanavir and um, decided to start assigning the parcels. But something I didn't know, and um, others I've talked to didn't know this either, is that I always thought that, in, that everybody in Sanavir um, owned land through the allotment. And it was only them from Sanavir. That's not true. Not everybody in Santa Vera is an Alati or a future Alati, as they call it. And also, too, they, there are Autumn that are not from Santa Vera that 
our allottees. So what happened with that is any autumn that was in Santa Vir, when they started um, giving out the parcels of land, could get in line and get land. And so um, we're tracing back some of the names and wondering, well, you know, how, how did this family become to be in Santa Vir? Or, you know, um, asking those types of questions. Again, some of them are because of allotment. And so, um, you know, really interesting, really fascinating. Um, and was looking at what allotment and the history of land and water. And so um, looking at the Dawes Act, it was a, the direct response, uh, res it was directly responsible for the loss of 90 million acres of Native American lands. So you see here on this chart, um, and it kind of starts breaking it down for you to see how the land is lost. And so um, between 1903 to 1933, 2 million acres of land, uh, Indian land passed into white hands each year. And so, um, you know, you had tribes that were living on the East Coast and all through that area on the um, Eastern part of the United States and they were all pushed um, west of the Mississippi. And then, so you see that land of loss start taking place. And then you start seeing um, Native Americans being put on reservation. So then that's even more land loss. And then on top of that, you start seeing um, allotment happen. And so then that ex the excess land that was left over from allotment um, was a lot of times given to um, white settlers. And so, you know, again, just seeing how the land just starts to decrease. And so, um, but in Santa Fe, again, there wasn't a shock um, or a total, um, you had to, like in other tribes where you, they had to totally learn a whole new way of life. But for us, it, we just kept farming. <laughs> and so, um, you know, I, I asked people and from, you know, what they've heard from their families and it was just, you know, yeah, there were these parcels. Yeah, they were kind of, you know, you had kind of boundaries now, lines <laughs> drawn around, but we continue, continue to still do what we were doing. And, you know, being um, a community, we all took care of each other. So nothing really changed until later on in time. And so again, 1890 is when um, Santa Vera was allotted. And there were 292 allotments, which totaled 41,000 acres. That, that's what happened. That's um, the numbers at that time in 1890. And um, also too, looking at um, today, so in comparison, there's 1,800 landowners as of um, numbers that I collected last January when there was a meeting that took place. And so you say, well, how do they get from 292 to 1,800? Um, you know, and looking at those individuals and how does that happen? Um, and it's because then the land, um, the allotments are passed from one generation to the next. And so you have then many individuals over the years, generations, and the land becomes fractionated. So for example, if you got, I'm terrible at math, by the way, so you can do the math, but say you had two kids and you had, you know, 80 acres. So when you pass away, mm -hmm. say you were the lot and you're given the land, then the land gets split between your two kids, right? They have interest in that. So then say your two kids each have five kids of their own. So then all those children get interest in that and then so forth and so forth. So then, you know, your ownership 
if you're in a lot tea, can be very small um, when it comes to that parcel of land. And I'm still trying to figure that out for myself because I'm a future a lot tea and understanding, you know, where our parcels are and understand trying to trace back to who the original person was. But also too, the interesting part of this is that, um, you know, with your allotment that you have, um, you know, it can, you can decide if it goes to, again, all of your kids, if it goes to one or how that's kind of dispersed also is another part of this. So again, very complex and um, I'm still trying to understand it and figure it out because I need to know these things. Um, Cause again, uh, I'll be becoming an Alati down the road. Um, and so here's a picture of Senebir Del, ba Del Bach mission around 1900 and to kind of give you a visual of what it looked like. And I love these old historical photos. Um, and so this is looking west to the to the church. And here's another image. This is looking northeast, but to kind of zoom out a little to give you um, an idea of what it looked like. And then back behind the church, you can see some of the farmlands. And so you have you have allotment that happens, right? And you have um, this idea of individualism, land ownership that comes in. But again, it really doesn't affect us and we keep continuing on. And so it's not till later that being a law TB starts becoming a real factor within Santa Beer. And that's just, and that's coming from uh, interviews I've had and um, conclusions that I've made with talking to individuals because um, it wasn't till you had outsiders start coming and using all the water, trying to have a land development proposed and done on the on the Santa Rita, in the Santa Rita district and other parts that then people really started to pay attention to, okay, what does an Alati mean? You know, what what do we gotta do to prevent, you know, for example, the the land, the land proposal um, to happen, you know, how do we get our water back and looking at these different things. So um, so again, you know, we in Santa Rivera families, we farm the land and, um, you know, we use canal systems to irrigate fields that were designed by our ancestors. And also too in Santa Rivera, we had the Santa Cruz River. So that was right at, at our back door. Um, and it was, and so we used this, we used the Santa Cruz River. And, but unfortunately the water in the Santa Cruz was taken and used um, by people like the city of Tucson when it started to grow. And so um, Santa Rivera in Autumn is called Wak, which means where the water goes in. And that's referring to our aquifers that we have in Santa Rivera. So um, what happens is in reference to Wak, um, so the water would disappear underground and then show up at another place. And so that's where the, the reference is where the water goes in. And so um, that was, that, that's how we got our name. And so we always had that water source to use, but then, um, like I said, it got depleted and it got used up. And one of the things that for us um, in our outcome culture is that we never overtake. We only take what we need. And that is not only for water that goes for our harvesting, the saguaro fruit, um, you know, our uh, choya buds and everything, you know, in the environment. But when you have an, other individuals that don't have that same mindset, then, you know, things can happen. 
So what happened? You don't have water, then you can't farm. And so this caused farming to become something of, of the past um, in Sanavir. And so then um, in the 1920s and 30s, the BIA, Bureau of Indian Affairs, they drill irrigation wells to supply water to the farm fields. And then the groundwater table declines in the 1960s. And then, um, you know, pretty much it's just done. And then the Ottoman and Sanavir were, you know, got together and said, we need to do something because if our traditional ecological knowledge, if them do not farm, then it really will become something of the past and no one will do it anymore. And there's so much loss that could happen with that. And so um, again, you have the elders that get together in Sanavir at what we call our rock house and they come up with a plan and they decide that they're gonna, that they are gonna piece the land back together and they're gonna get a lot of team members that are landowners to help and agree to let the community use their, these parcels of land they have um, so they can find a way to farm again. And so that happened in 1971. And, um, and that's when the cooperative uh, was was began and it was started. And so um, I've had the pleasure of sitting down with, um, this is Clifford Pablo and talking with him. And he was the individual that was tasked with going and talking to these 46, um, the, 40, the individuals that had interest in these 46 allotments to ask them to help. And if it would be okay for them to, for him to use their allotted land to be able to um, start the co-op. And so this is actually an original document that he had. And I was like, so amazed by it. And he had all of these, again, original documents that he had from the sixties into the seventies. And he was just like, yeah, I just have them in a box. <laughs> and I was like, these are like diamonds to me. I'm like, this is amazing. and. And of course, it really touched home because um, I saw my family's names within this this list in this documents that he had. So he started going around and you know finding out um, who to talk to and getting the permission. And he was really um, the one behind getting the Santa Beer Cooperative Farm um, going, and also with helping bring back farming within Santa Beer. And um, this is a photo of him in cells for an article that I wrote that I'll, I'll share with you later. And so this is what the Senator um, co-op or cooperative looks like today. And so, um, you know, here are pictures of co-op workers um, harvesting carrots. So at the Senator co-op, the goal is to be able to provide um, traditional autumn foods, but also to um, in order to make ends meet, you got to be able to have um, income. And so they also um, grow and sell uh, non-traditional autumn foods as well. So the, right here, they're holding up carrots. And then you can see in this photo on the right um, with the tractor out getting the hay. So looking even more so, um, into water issues. So you have the water that gets completely used up. So Sanavir tries to figure out, well, what can we do? First of all, they start piecing the land back together. And then um, in 1975, you have uh, the Thanatham, excuse me, um, file suit against all of these, um, entities, outsiders, um, meaning non-tribal, that used up the aquifer, used up the water. So you have agribusinesses, owners, 
we had a the copper mine so the circle copper mine was built just south of um, the Sanavir district in the 1950s into the 60s and then you had the city of Tucson and the growth of, of the city um, that you know these individuals were all draining water from the aquifer beneath the Sanavir district so um, in the end Congress passed SWARSA, which is the Southern Arizona Water Rights Settlement Act. And so a night and that happened in 1982. So it granted 50,000 acre feet of water a year to Sanavir through the Central Arizona Project, so CAP, to be able to bring back farming, to be able to not let the traditional ecological knowledge disappear. And so but again, it, you know, as I, I'm digging through this, I'm like, oh, okay, this happened and this happened. But with talking with Clifford, he was like, you know, this did not happen overnight. This took a lot of time and effort and to get this all done because then Sanavir had to make room to be able to have the pipes come from the CAP to the farms. And then also too, um, when farming essentially started to disappear in Sanavir, he had shared with me that the land, the landowners, the Latis then started leasing the land to be used by non autumn farmers. And there was um, at one point in time, a white farmer and then another was an Asian farmer. And so between them, um, one of them used pesticides when they were farming. Um, and so it destroyed a lot of the land. So when the co-op was created, there was a lot that had to be done to be able to get the land back to where it should be in order to be healthy and be able to use it again. And so um, again, that's just part of um, uh, interview that I had with Clifford and with him sharing. And again, you know, going into these interviews, yes, I have a set of questions that I ask, but also to, you know, realizing that I then have so many more questions <laughs> other than what's on my list and having to go back and sit with these elders several times to really start to understand because there's not that many um, autumn elders that are still around that were there when all of this took place. And it's unfortunate and it's sad but that's part of the reason and motivation for me to be able to share this information with you today, but then also to write about it and have it um, you know, in a written format that can be shared. So, um, so then through SWARSA, this allowed for farming to be, um, to be productive for the community again. And then in 1991, the Santa Barbara Lati Association, so SXAA was formed to help educate um, and assist landowners of allotments or allottees um, with whatever happens, you know, on in San here. And so again, you know, all this time passed and it wasn't until later on, then people started to pay attention to what it means to be a landowner. And that's a very complex and complicated um, topic and title for somebody. And so um, the Alachi Association, uh, they work with, you know, as, as an organization, but also to the, you know, they help individuals to manage their land. So relating to, again, water rights, economic development, environmental protection, and so forth. And they, they're a resource. And so, um, but in 2004, um, there were amendments made to SWARSA because you had the Thanatha Nation representing um, San Navir. And there's conflict that occurs be and that has occurred between the San Navir district, the Lati members, the Thanatha Nation. So you see there's all these different parties that are involved specifically in San Navir. And so and there were a lot that did not feel that their, um, that, the original source of the act um, was in the best interest of the Lottis because this is, is their land, you know, they have land ownership. And so um, that's how those amendments were made. And I could, again, Swarsa, I 
could sit here and talk to you and give a presentation on it for an hour and that would not even be enough time. <laughs> so, and I really hope that eventually uh, we can actually make it into a, a class and look at Swarsa and spend a whole semester on it. So um, something to look forward to and hope that we can, we can develop and have that in the future. Um, and so again, you know, it's very diving into this as a Santa Vera um, community member and not realizing, you know, just how, again, complex and intricate and everything that this goes into because, again, you know, land ownership is good, but then looking at it in this, specifically in Santa Vera, it gets complicated, you know, and also to a part of um, the reason I'm doing my research on the land and water in Santa Vera is because there are generations that don't know how important this is to be an Alati, what it means to be an Alati, um, and understanding it and knowing the history and everything that you know I'm explaining and talking with you today. So, <clears throat> and here are more photos I wanted to share. So this is my grandma, um, and she. So with one of the com one of the meetings and conversations I had with Clifford, he was showing me old photos, and he he was going through them and he had them up on this projector screen for me, and he said, "And there she is," and there was my grandma, and so she passed away in 2011, but having her be throughout my research and seeing her pop up at all these different times is really neat to see. And I've never seen this photo of her. <laughs> so I kind of got all teary eyed when he showed it to me. And um, this is her biting into some sugar cane that um, I don't know if it still grows in the co-op um, farm area, but that's where she was. And that's what the land used to look like behind her. And if you've ever been to the co-op now and how lush and green, and even looking in my background right now, this is the center of your co-op <laughs> um, when corn is growing. And so you can see how green it is in my, in, the, in my background and then how it once looked prior to that. And then this is, um, there's greenhouses on, on the, co-op farm grounds and so they're all being dried out the mesquite beans uh, or pods I should say and so and then these are pictures of um, what is grown at the co-op some of the items traditional items so you have tapered taper beans you have red and white and then this is um, mesquite flour so here's the mesquite and then it gets grinded up and it's made into flour and you can make some really delicious meals with it. Um, my favorite is to make um, mesquite flour muffins and cookies. So as we start to kind of wrap up, um, I've talked about my dissertation research without throughout this presentation and um, you know, there's other parts of the Santa Vera uh, history when in regards to land and water. Um, so I'll have chapters looking at the co-op farm, looking at Sorsa and being able to break down Sorsa and have people understand what happened. Because I even have this document that um, my auntie put together and it still is very complex when you read it and it's supposed to be a summary. <laughs> so being able to, again, look at those, talk with my elders, have my elders, my elders help. My Auntie Julie Ramon Piercing is a big um, person that is a part of my, of my research. She was there through all of this and um, being able to have her sit on my dissertation committee is another big part of this too. So also looking at the defenders of autumn land rights. They're the ones that, um, got together to really um, go up against when there was a, a land development proposal that was made in Santa Vera that wanted to turn the, the person who came, um, he was non-native, he wanted to turn Santa Vera into Palm Springs, California. So I couldn't even imagine. And then also to being able to talk about the Santa Vera Latte Association and their history and what they do. Um, and they just held a, uh, conference for youth so they can better um, 
become um, educated about what it means to be an Alati, um, looking at land and water issues within Stanavir. So, um, but just to wrap, wrap up looking, you know, again, talking a little bit more at my dissertation research. So it all came from talking with my auntie Julie and having conversations and, um, you know, realizing the real need for it to be within not only my community, but others too on the Thought Out the Nation that don't know about our history and don't understand, um, you know, why it's different than our other parcels of land that make up the Thought Out the Nation. So, um, and then also too, I'm doing community-based research. So yes, I have, Santa Maria is well documented. Yes, I have um, literature and really fascinating old documents that I'm using, but another big part of this is actually hearing again from the individuals that were there and what they remember and you know what they want to share. So as we wrap up, um, as you saw on the one of the slides before we started, um, these are a couple of articles that were covered um, from the Arizona Daily Star. This is my grandma again right here. And then this is my other grandma right here. And um, seeing them in these articles and also to this is Sally Estrada, but who's, she has passed away. So seeing them and seeing the fight and not never giving up and being able to, you know, share with reporters and have articles written, it's been awesome, especially as having a journalism background and digging out um, these old articles and, you know, searching for them and being able to find them. It, it's, it's really cool um, to see these. And again, being able to share with you all. Um, this one's from 1990, and then this other one's from 2006. And as we end, so we've been talking about how the history, um, what happened in history and how the, how the water was, with the aquifer, dried up and the water was taken from us and used up. But in recent years, the last couple of years, um, the aquifer started flowing again. So here's a picture of um, in the Santa Cruz and this is actually looking north. And so that is really something remarkable to see. And um, because it's always been talked about in the past. And for my generation, you know, even the ones that are elders now, you know, being able to see water and to see that aquifer um, in the Santa Cruz, it, it's, some of us couldn't believe it. And, you know, everybody starts kind of talking in the community, did you hear this? No, is it, is it really, have you gone and seen? <laughs> And so, you know, of course, driving over that bridge too to get to I-19 and um, parts of South Tucson and it's, you know, really looking over there to see and it was, you know, and it, again, it's just amazing to see and to know that, you know, um, that it, it's been able to come back and to kind of, again, end on a happy note and to kind of talk about this. And there was an article written about this in, uh, Arizona Daily Star, I think it was 2019 that talked about this. And, you know, again, just it being something of the past that we never thought, I never thought in my generation I would see, you know, in my lifetime or anybody else from my generation. And, but, you know, it, to see it again is something really great. So um, I believe that's my last slide. So this is my contact information. Um, happy to answer any questions questions if I don't get to them today, or even to just to talk and have more conversation and um, discussions with you all. So um, Lisa, do you want to help me out with questions? Yes, thank you for that comprehensive history and personal stories. And, and that's really what brings history alive um, and gives us the different perspectives when you can hear from the people who have fought and struggled and thought about it and live with it every day. So thank you so much. Um, we have a lot of questions, 24 in fact. So um, 
I'll have to dig through them to pass them on to you, but um, so one is how has the border wall impacted your water resources or has it? Um, that's a really good question. So not relating to Sanavir, um, but going out more west, um, we have our a spring out there, Quito Baquito, which maybe you've seen articles on, um, but when the border wall construction was going on, um, water was being used from that spring. And um, so it's starting to become depleted and there's endangered species that are in that um, sacred spring. So that's what I think of um, with, in regards to that question. And there's a really good article by National Geographic that I share with my students <laughs> that talk about that and show pictures. And um, I highly suggest you checking that out. Was that recently, the National Geographic article? Mm, yeah, I believe actually it might have been late last year, or earlier this year. Okay. Um, so somebody is wondering about the origins of who Hugam um, knowledge of hydrology. Was it derived from Mesoamerican interactions or something they developed on their own? That's a really good question. Um, that's not my background. I, I'm not um, anthropologist or archeologist in any of that. Um, I just have the knowledge that's been shared through our storytelling about um, our ancestors and the Hugam, you know, and how they, how they lived and um, survived. Okay. And um, Mark Severinsen made a comment. He says, I have also heard that some people at Little Tucson, excuse my autumn, Al Chakson and Santa Rosa Guachi are descendants of the Sobrapuri. Have you heard that? I have not. Um, most most of what I've heard has just come out of Sanavir um, in regards to the Sopapir or Savipuri. But um, I mean, I wouldn't, I wouldn't be surprised because, you know, the more and more, um, you know, I, again, dive into this topic for my dissertation research, you know, linking ties to how, you know, again, individuals and a lot of them from other, other parts of um, a reservation came to Sanavir to work in the farms. So, you know, having those ties to, again, other communities and villages. So again, I, yeah, I wouldn't be surprised, but definitely a question that I'm gonna ask um, Dr. Denny Seymour about. Right, and we do share all the questions and chats um, with our speakers, so. Um, and I will mention that Giselle had a lot of wonderful resources she shared with us to share with you and Darlene has put them into the chat for you, um, including, uh, a link to the co-op store. So um, somebody is wondering why the San Javier district appears to be separated from the main reservation lands. That's a really good question. So um, 18, 1874 is when that area was designated as a reservation for us, Autumn, but um, it became apparent that we all couldn't live in Santa Verde. Um, you know, and that wasn't our only area that Autumn lived. So in the 1917s into the early 1920s, um, there was another executive order that was made to then give um, us a second parcel, which is the main part of our reservation, um, which is west of, of Santa Verde. And um, you know, within our ancestral lands. And so that's how we got that second parcel. And then in Gila Bend area, that's another one that was given, a parcel that was given to us. And then finally in Florence, uh, city of Florence gave us our fourth parcel because there were autumn that worked in the farms there. And so they gave, again, the Thon Autumn Nation a small parcel of land there to be added. So, um, you know, it would have been great if we had all the way from Santa Verde heading all the way out to the main part of the reservation, you know, uh, that all connected, but um, that's not how it worked out with the president at the time and with the executive order that was signed. 
that kind of rolls into a, a related but different question. Um, somebody was wondering if, was it part of the allotment process that created the checkerboard, and you may not know the answer to this, the checkerboard situation on the Navajo reservation? Um, I know allotment does have a lot to do with checkerboard because when I, I lived and worked in Oklahoma, that was the case too. Mm -hmm. And, but a lot of times, like uh, it's very different when it comes to allotment in other communities because in Oklahoma, a lot of the allotments were then sold to um, non-natives, even though you're not supposed to, in according to the federal government, you're not supposed to sell it. The only person you're able, you're supposed to be able to sell your land, your allotted land to was back to the federal government, but they did. So then it's, you get checkerboard. And so a lot of times I'd be driving one minute and I'd be on the reservation, you know, or somebody's allotted land, then I wouldn't be, then I would be, then I wouldn't. And so, yeah. Yeah. So somebody was wondering, what are some of the reasons why autumn people believe information should not be shared either with other autumn or with outsiders? Um, so being an oral society, that's how our knowledge has been passed down um, for time immemorial. And so, you know, that's still the case today. And there's knowledge that is specific for autumn um, to know. And though, again, those are a lot of those are told through our stories, but also too, it, it's, um, I don't know how to explain it. This is, it's kind of hard um, with, you know, think of it with your families and you, don't necessarily, I mean, there is information about your family that maybe you would share with somebody, but then there's other information you wouldn't because it's private and that's your, that's your knowledge that, you know, you want to keep. And that's kind of similar to when it comes to, um, you know, our Atham Himathuk, in my opinion. And, um, but that's just with non Atham. Um, you know, of course, there's times where I've, there's other, um, individuals from other tribes and you know we share we kind of relate like what do you do in your culture oh I do this you know I mean there's sharing like that that can happen to a certain degree um, and that's that's just something I've always been taught and so again when it comes to historical information I've gotten permission from my elders um, and also within my own perspective of it's time for this historical information to start being written down Again, yes, we're an oral society and that should be continued. But again, we need to write this down before it's lost. And so, uh, you know, we have elders that are dying younger and younger, um, you know, from various things, but diabetes being one of the highest um, causes of death for us. And uh, again, that knowledge isn't passed or, you know, somehow, um, it skips a generation or that generation that did learn it doesn't pass. You know, there's all these different scenarios that can happen, but um, you know, I always just try to share that and let people know that, you know, what I'm writing down is, is, is historical. It's, you know, of course it encompasses our culture, our tradition, as I mentioned, our traditional ecological knowledge, but you know, I'm not talking about things that I shouldn't be. Thanks. And somebody was wondering in terms of the allotments and how they're passed down or given out, um, was there a gender bias um, with men or women, would they be inherited equally? Or does that depend on the family? It depends on the family and how, um, you know, that's, that's worked out. Um, we are a patrilineal society, so um, males were in charge, not to say that women didn't have a role. Um, but yeah, it's, it's all based upon the family and how the family um, distributes. Because a lot of times, you know, when somebody passes away, it's the eldest child that then, you know, if a parent passes away, it's the eldest child that then becomes responsible for everything. And then they inherit, you know, all of the documents, the land also. But then, you know, that eldest child then can say, well, I don't want all the responsibility and then divide it among their siblings. And that's what happened within my family when my grandma passed away. And so then, you know, the land gets divided among everybody and then they get to choose what they want to do with their parcel. 
again, it's very complicated and I'm still trying to make sense of it. And I'm like, okay, let's run through it again <laughs> when I talk with my auntie or my mom, just to make sure I have it like understood. <laughs> and, but again, too, it's just, and then when somebody passes away, um, you know, that maybe didn't have children, then, you know, who's the next in, in line, you know, the kin and with that, that could be, you know, maybe their siblings, children then would in, inherit that, um, that lot or that parcel. I have a question to myself. Are all the allotted lands at San Javier now incorporated into the farm or are there other allotted lands at San Javier? Um, as far, as far as I know, majority of it is, but there are other parts that aren't. So, um, you know, there's in Santa Avir, there's 71,000 acres with 41,000 of it. So almost half of Santa Avir is allotted land versus, um, tribal land, you know, with the district and, um, everybody operates on. So there are people that live on their allotted land. There's the allotted land within the farm. And then there's also two, um, the Asarco mind, they um, had tribal members lease land to them, um, but that land is no longer usable because of the runoffs from the mine. Um, so yeah, there's all these different areas um, and that's numbers I'm working on for my dissertation research to figure out the exact numbers of where you know everything is and there's maps too and so um i just don't have those right so did the dawes act come to a total end in 1933 or what what ended the dawes act and when um that's a really good question and so um yeah it, on my slide I, I had on there the years of when it took place, which was 1887 to 1934. And um, so, you know, again, with picking and choosing and being able to, you know, go through and look at the tribes that, you know, would, how would you say, like, essentially fit into this, you know, and be able to farm, ranch, harvest, um, and off the top of my head, I'm blanking on why it, why it ended, and that's terrible because I'm a because <laughs> of my my background. Um, but uh, that's a really good question. Are any of the old who who come canals visible today in the San Javier area, or he doesn't specify, but I'm just assuming that maybe anywhere. Yeah. Um. Yeah. I mean those if you're talking in general, I mean, you know, there's uh, articles that come out that talk about, you know, being able to find, you know, these intricate canal systems, you know, throughout history, throughout time, and, you know, um, undigging them. And then also to in Sanavir, a lot of them were, a lot of the areas were repaired and um, the canal systems were, uh, I don't know the proper terminology for it, but they were um, cemented and and used. But um, I don't I don't know if um, in the co-op farm if how that's situated with using canals and then the CAP. Um, right. I'm not a farmer, so something for your over busy schedule, right? <laughs> yeah, something on my to do list to add <laughs> in. <laughs> Somebody mentioned that it was the 1934 Indian Reorganizational Act that ended. Oh, yes, Latin. that's great. So um, let's see. If walk means where the water goes in, is there a name or a place for where the water rises? Or is that you know the opposite, going in or rising? Um, I was always told it's where the water goes in. She's just wondering if there's any other name for where the water rises up. Not that I know of. Yeah, okay. Um, so 
So prior to allotments, were specific lands owned by individuals or families, or was it all tribally owned? So specifically in Santa Rita, before allotment, it was very relational and communal. So everybody had, you know, an, uh, their own family farm area where they lived and they farmed, but everybody helped each other and being able to um, share foods, the work, you know, whatnot, that's what everybody, excuse me, that's what everybody did. So again, you know, when I was asking these questions and I was doing my interviews, um, you know, it, everybody said, well, even though, after, you know, allotment happened, no one really paid attention to the lines that were made to create these parcels. Everybody just kept on with how they had been and helping each other and making sure everybody had enough food through, um, you know, the winter and everybody was fed. And, you know, of course you made sure that you had enough for your own family, but you also made sure that your relatives and your neighbors did too. And then also to helping with dividing the work with managing a farm. Right. Uh, one person asked, does San Javier today collect on its rights to 50,000 acre feet of water or does it sell part of them to others? So that's a really good question. And that is very complicated because um, when the nation has interest, the Thon Altham nation has interest within the water. So whatever doesn't get used, um, the Thon Altham nation can use and they can sell the water credits. So um, that was something towards the end of my interviews, I started to get into with asking questions and starting to understand that. But um, at the same time questioning, is that really what I'm trying to understand within my dissertation research or is that a, like a paper on its own? <laughs> yeah. So again, but that's a really good question because you're looking at who has interest and who is all involved when it comes to land and water issues. And it's again, very complicated, complex because you have the Lattes, you have the Santa Cruz District, you have the Thon Altham Nation, um, you know, and everybody trying to work together and, you know, understanding the frustrations from the Lattes and, you know, the Santa Cruz Santa Cruz Co-op Farm also has a co-op board that has um, individuals that sit on that board, you know, who who discuss you know, matters like this and, um, you know, running the farm and the operations and the ins and outs, so. How many families are members of the co-op? Um, or less? Well, I know, like I mentioned, there's uh, 1,800 individuals um, that are Alatis in Sanavir. Um, I don't know how many have interest within the co-op or lease their land to the co-op. Um, mm -hmm. I've been trying to work with the Santa Rita Latte Association to get updated numbers on that because even that 1800, um, that was from a year ago okay. in January. Tina so, said that it's around 1200. Is it? Oh, okay. Yay, thank you. <laughs> um, so somebody was wondering if there's other co-ops like the farm co-op um, in other areas of the Autumn Nation? No, that's the Santa Rita Co-op is the only co-op. Um, there are, <clears throat> uh, Clifford, he does work with the Don Autumn Community College and he has um, an internship program and they have a small one acre farm um, on the west end of cells that um, he, teaches them how to farm and grow. And um, it's a really cool opportunity for students who are interested in agriculture. Um, we also do have a, a farm um, that is within the Shukduak district, which is off of Sandario Road. And um, usually in the summertime when they have corn, tribal members can go and pick and take truck fulls of corn if they want. Um, we have Papa Go Farms. So um, yeah, but actually running like a, a co-op, like a business, um, Sanavir is the only one within the Thon Nation. 
And that doesn't, I don't know if it's still in operation, but doesn't um, Toka use uh, Terrell D. Johnson's family farm and train students to be farmers on it? Yeah, and um, that was something that was really instrumental and really great um, to have in the 90s into the 2000s. And so um, as far as I know, Terrell still does things, um, but at a smaller scale, because we did have, he did have, um, you know, the Desert Rain Cafe, which was on the Thanatha Nation. And, you know, we as tribal members love that. And a lot of, you know, people passing through would um, really enjoy having that because it used traditional foods in a contemporary way and healthy way and gave tribal members a healthy option, which we really don't um, in cells. And so that was really awesome, but it closed. And um, last I heard it was, they had opened that, opened back up, but in Ajo on certain days. Oh so, yeah, that's part of uh, Nina's work there, yeah. Yeah. Um, it's working with the Ajo CSA um, and the new farmer's market in cells. I'm, I'm reading, Sienna's giving me little comments here. And that farm is called the Pancho Memorial Farms that was from uh, Toka. And I do know that Toka would love to open its restaurant. So if any of you wanna be a supporter of that, they're looking for uh, sponsors. Um, I will just mention that. Um, so here's another one that um, you may know the answer to, or seen them any to pipe up for is, is the co-op all organically farmed? Are there pest control methods to use currently that were passed down and are specific to the farmers or the farmers in San Javier? Oh. <laughs> I, it's probably a Sina uh, answer, huh? <laughs> yeah, I, I'm still learning with the, the co-op, but I do want to mention that it's really cool that we do have individuals that have worked at the co-op that were part of um, the Thon Out the Community Action, so TOCA, that have, you know, learned there and brought that knowledge to the farm. And so that's been really cool to see over the years, um, you know, individuals that were part of those pro summer programs and internships and whatnot, and um, were able to carry that knowledge. And even, um, I know one individual in Santa Vera where he interned, but from, with TOCA, but he doesn't work at the farm, but in his own property from time to time, we'll have his own little garden or and farm in there and harvest. So that's really cool to see. Sina piped up and said, the farm grows naturally without pesticides. And for those of you who don't know, um, Sina used to work at the farm for a very long time. And I know her from work we did with the co-op farm. So that's why we keep referring to her. <laughs> and I interviewed her for my dissertation research. So <laughs> there you go. very knowledgeable person. So thank you for being here and helping me with these questions. And somebody wanted um, to know the answer to what is the language of the Tanatum people? Um, so our... Uh, it's Otham Nyok. So um, my introduction at the very beginning was all in Otham to kind of give you an idea of what it sounds like. And the way you see a farm in Otham is Oitak. So just to give you another preview. Maybe you could describe what Himdag means. Sure. So um, I referenced that in my presentation. So our Himdag is translates to our way of life. And um, every autumn has their own interpretation, their own definition of what um, Himatag means to them. But it incorporates, um, you know, what what they hold most important to themselves. Um, you know, for myself, it's storytelling. It's um, you know, looking at family. You know, my family life. Um, you know, there's uh, other parts of it is values, you know, your family values as well, um, your beliefs, and how, um, you know, you live your life every single day. Um, you know, it's, it's whatever, it's whatever makes you you and what you find important in life. Right. And um, Lois Eisenstein loves her idea of developing a class based on Swarsa and would offer her help, wants to know mm -hmm. how to help, and I can send you her email. She is a docent at the State Museum. Uh, another docent at the State Museum, Mia Vera, said, it appears the 
Dawes Act was intended to divide the Otham land and water to eventually water it down until there is no reservation or Otham ownership. It seems that it is being successful if people are fighting among themselves over land and water ownership. Are the Alatis recognizing this? Um, yeah, I think, you know, that's where the San Rio Alati Association comes in to try to help, you know, um, I wouldn't say necessarily they're like a middleman, but they're there to assist and help and help in any way they can to um, have Alatis understand what could potentially happen to their land if there's you know proposed land you know development you know economic development whatnot um, you know and, and what that looks like, but you know it is kind of hard with families um, that don't all agree upon um, decisions and sometimes. Um, you know, that can be difficult because you want to do something with a parcel of land that you have interest in, but if not everybody's in agreement, then that can't happen. So I'm really thankful I come from a small family. So <laughs> <laughs> we're all, you know, kind of on board <laughs> with the, with agreeing with everything and decisions that are made, <laughs> but um, it can get really difficult and really hard. But in these times throughout history, when there needed to be, um, you know, committees formed, individuals getting together, whatnot, it's happened. And it's really awesome to see that and having people realize, you know what, we, we need to come together as a community and do something. Because if, the, if that didn't happen in the, you know, 60s, would we have a co-op today? You know, who knows? And our, our knowledge and could be totally gone from, from when it comes to farming, harvesting, our TEK. So, you know, very grateful and thankful that individuals noticed that and did something about it. And, you know, there's a, the Santa Rita Latte Association holds meetings. Um, well, not since the pandemic, but typically two meetings a year. So they can sit down and address these issues and talk and have presentations and, um, you know, get insight from landowners and, and, you know, um, kind of figure out what a possible solution could be if it affects everybody, you know, or if it only affects, you know, so many, whatnot. So again, a really good resource to have. Well, I just have two more questions for you. Okay. I know it's getting long and, I, and there's a lot of, a lot of interest in what you're talking about. I think your research is really important. Uh, for your family, for your community, but the broader public is also interested. Um, and there's a ton of thank yous in uh, the chat that we will share with you. Um, so one person I wonder, does OSCO have the responsibility to rehabilitate the land you mentioned from the mines? Asarco, sorry, I pronounced that wrong. Oh, say that again. I does Asar Asarco have the responsibility to rehabilitate the lands that you mentioned? that were messed up by the mine trailings and all? Um, I know the Santa Rita District has had conversations with um, ASARCO and also within um, the district and the council and the community with trying to figure out what to do with those lands. Um, and my grandpa, he had, uh, he's a part of that where he leased land, not, you know, being told or realizing what that could be what the land could look like in the future, mm -hmm. um, you know, and so here we are. And there's been discussions over the years to, you know, maybe putting solar panels out there or, um, you know, different things like that. And they've been discussed, but it's again, really unfortunate that, you know, it was in a sense, a way for us individuals to make money because they were leasing it and a circle was paying them. But then that started to fluctuate with the um, value of copper. And um, so then now it's just kind of, again, you're these, a lot of teams are left with land that they can't do anything with. And so, um, but I, I'm hoping that in the future, the district, um, the district council and the community, we can all come to an agreement on something to do. I think having solar panels out there would be a really good um, idea, but that's just me. You know, that sounds good. Good use of land that can't be used for other things safely. Um, Sina said there is mine reclamation on some of the land that is out there. 
uh, out of lease, that's out of lease, excuse me. And then a final question. Um, and, and somebody, say, Sienna asked, also asked if the recording will be shared. And I will say that, um, that Jazlel is going to decide that after she's reviewed it. <laughs> um, but Sienna, you know Giselle, and you can get in touch with her about it. Um, and one final question is, how is the San Javier community involved in the discussions re restoring the Santa Cruz River using recycled water, or are they? Also, it is my understanding that cap recharging is causing the Santa Cruz to flow just south of the mission. What actions are the community involved in to restore flow to the Santa Cruz using the cap allotments, if any? So Sienna can probably help me answer that question. Um, so uh, there is a Santa Cruz um, collaborative watershed um, organization that I've recently got in contact with. And they informed me that um, the Santa Rita district is um they are working in the santa Rita district so that was really awesome because i got referred to um the collaborative not through the district and so to see that they are they are involved and um so that was really cool to see and also learn more about their organization and how we can collaborate and i did a presentation back in february um similar to this one for them and um you know, connecting with individuals and sources. And so it was really cool. And, um, you know, for us to us, meaning the community started to see the water flow again. Um, there was a ceremony that was held that we did. And um, I wasn't a part of it. Um, because I just had had my daughter. So I was at home. But um, it was really cool to see pictures that were shared. We have um, a private Facebook page and then have these individuals come together and say that we need to do something to honor this and give thanks um, to Mother Earth, to our creator, you know, for having the water flow again, which again, many of us never thought we would see in our lifetime. Mm -hmm. So I think that was a really great thing for our community to come together and even share with the younger ones of why we were having that ceremony and um, you know really thankful for those individuals that stepped up to organize it and have um, you know the, a part for the women and a part for the male and um, you know I think that was really cool I don't know if Sienna has anything to add to that question to that question. the San Javier District Natural Resource Department is monitoring the flows and planning for future yeah. And I want to say I remember um, Jerry Carlisle sharing stories about remembering as a as a young boy, you know, riding on horseback and having the trees knock you off the top of the horse. And so he's very excited to see the trees growing at the riparian area, the cottonwoods that are getting big there and everything again, which is as a result of the cap water. So. Yeah. And I think and that's one of the other things is that, you know, my my grandma would tell me stories of what it used to look like along the Santa Cruz when she was little and you know and it's just like just trying to imagine it yourself when you're like no <laughs> you know it's like there's no way and she's like yeah it was didn't look like it looks like today and it was really shady and you know it was cool and then us having the hick done to be able to kind of replicate that and give us an idea of what it looks like but then even now with you know the the water starting to um, run again a little bit in that photo, you start seeing how green it is right there and, you know, what's growing. And it's just amazing because a lot of times, you know, individuals see the desert as just this hot, <laughs> desolate place, which it can be, but also too, you know, how beautiful it can be and how things can grow with just a little bit of water. And That's so, true. yeah, yeah. Well, this has been fabulous. I hope you will consider publishing your dissertation when it's done, because I'd love to read it. So thank you, everybody, and good evening. And thank you so much, Giselle. Thank you all for joining. Bye-bye.